Come on, Harbor Church, what's up? Good morning. Man, it's good to be here. Good to see you guys. I'm so glad we get to spend some time together today. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for checking us out. Man, I'm glad you're here. This is going to be an exciting day as we kind of lean into what it is that God has for us. Uh, now, I'm, I'm pumped. Um, I'm glad just to be around some adults right now. As you heard, our missions trip team, they are in Thailand or uh, Cambodia right now, and uh, they're having a blast. I did not go on that trip. I stayed here on the Cape, and my wife went on that trip. So I've been hanging out with my two kids and teaching them what college life is like. A lot of ramen noodles, a lot of macaroni and cheese, and if we're really feeling up to it, we'll order a pizza or something. So uh, definitely pray for our missions team. That's awesome that they're out there. Also pray for those of us who are left behind. Um, and we're, uh, we're having fun. If this is your first time or your first time in a long time, maybe you're joining us online, uh, watching from somewhere else, or you're listening to it on the podcast. My name is Josh. I'm the lead pastor here at Harbor Church, and we are now in the fifth week of a series that we're calling Liar, Liar. And what we're doing in this series is we're peeling back some of the, 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 the truth that's been buried underneath of layers of deception. Either it's our flesh, or maybe it's the devil, or it might just be the culture and the world we live in. We are easily deceived into living out half-truths. Um, and by that, I mean things that are just not God's best for us. And we just, we, we don't say we live a lie. We think it's true, but we think it's true because everybody else is doing, doing it or not doing it or whatever. And that leads us to believe that, man, I think I'm okay. I think it's right. And we don't even realize how far away from God's best we've gotten. Today, this morning, I'm going to talk about a very specific lie that has affected our church in Man, it's gotten worse and worse. It didn't used to be the majority of people believed this lie. Now it seems like it's, it's everywhere. The lie today that we're going to unpack is simply this. We Christians tend to believe that godly character is somehow negotiable. Now you might say, I, what do you mean? I don't think character is negotiable. Yeah, you may say you believe that you have to have character and we all want character. We wanna have morals and we wanna do the right thing, but truthfully we don't, we don't actually do it. You can tell by the fact that we don't hold up a godly standard in our life. This is not something that you see all the time. Now character can be defined a lot of different ways, but if we look at the Bible and we say, God, what do you got for us? What, what, should it, what should it look like for me to be somebody, somebody who's a Christ follower? What should that mean? Well, I think it should mean a couple of things. If you're taking notes, write this stuff down. Maybe, maybe one of these, the Holy Spirit, I'll poke you and say, hey, you could do better here. For me, it's every single one of them. So you can join me and be a complete you know, reprobate going, yeah, I, I'm, I suck at all of these. And maybe that's, that's what God's gonna show you today as well. Here's some of the things I've noticed. If I wanna have more character, if I wanna be somebody who has godly character, morals makes the right decisions, not just says the right thing, but actually does the right thing. Here's what's gonna look like in a bunch of different ways. Number one, it'll mean that when you give your word, you actually keep your word. Come on, somebody. When you give your word, this is, this, it used to be you could just do something on a handshake. That's how much character was present in, in our lives just a few generations ago. You didn't have to have a contract. You didn't have to be on videotape. You didn't have to give a blood oath and sign a thousand signatures. You could just shake hands and say, yeah, I'll be there. <coughs> or I'll sell you this. And this is the price. Or I'm gonna do it. If you said something and you gave your word to it, then you kept your word, and nobody could take that away from you. That's what it meant to have character. This is what the Bible says about that, Matthew 5, 37. It says, but let your yes be yes, and your no be no. If you say, I'll be there, then keep your word. If you said, I'll love you the rest of my life, and keep myself only for you till death do us part for better or worse. If you said it, keep your word. Freaking keep your word. Let's have the character so that when somebody runs into us, somebody at work, they're like, oh no, she said she'd do it. I know she'll do it. He said he'd be there. I know he'll be there. It should be, a, it should be a, a, such a, a weird, random thing for a Christian to not do what it is that they said they do. Unfortunately, 
you and I tend to act like that kind of character is negotiable. I said I'd be there, but now I don't feel like it. I said I would show up, but then I, 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 I'm kind of not feeling good. I said I'd volunteer to stand in the parking lot, but it's cold out, so I'm just going to stay home. Our word needs to mean something. Also, if you have character, then you should be more offended at sin than you are at being corrected. Some of you, you already don't like this message because you're like, I don't, think, I, don't, I don't think I need to hear about having character. Yes, you do. You get mad at all of the things that push you towards being more godly, all of the things that grow you in, in, your, in, in Christ-like character, those you get mad at, those you whine about, those you leave churches over. Those are the reasons that you send me some of the emails you send me. You get mad at, at somebody trying to help you grow to look more like Jesus, but then you don't get mad at all of the things in the world going on around you that break God's heart. Think about half the movies you watch. Some of that music that you listen to, the jokes that you let people tell you. <laughs> There's a lot of things going on in your life that break the heart of God and you tolerate them like, that's ah, just the culture we live in. But the second somebody tells you that you gotta, be, you, you gotta step to take, now all of a sudden you're frustrated. This is what the Bible says in Proverbs 15, 32. If you reject discipline, you only harm yourself. But if you listen, if you'll listen to correction, you'll grow in understanding. In Proverbs 12, it says this, to learn, in order to learn, you have to love discipline, also meaning correction. <laughs> it says, though, it's stupid to hate correction. Sometimes I just love how plain the Bible is. God's like, hey, you don't appreciate this correction. You dumb. You're stupid. Not meant to hurt your feelings, more to be a wake-up call. Also, having character would be one of these things that you recognize Man, I, I need to be corrected because if I'm walking off of a cliff, what should matter more to me is not that I'm having fun and that people make me feel good. It should matter to me that I'm heading in the wrong direction and somebody is willing to love me enough to tell me how to correct my course, to, to, to make a U-turn. One of our founding fathers, Thomas Paine, he once famously said, character is much easier kept than recovered. Some of you, you, you're doing okay right now, but you're, you're going down a path that's gonna ruin your life. It's gonna, you're gonna make some huge mistakes if you don't course correct and you get mad about me or somebody else in your life trying to help you see that. That's where you're, you're gonna have to step up and go, man, I, I appreciate somebody loving me enough to tell me what I don't wanna hear. Also, character will mean this. You're gonna care more about making progress in your walk with God than you do about being comfortable. Those two points dovetail together because if you care, man, I want to look more like Jesus. I want, to, I want to have a different way of thinking, a different way of talking. That is going to go against, and character says, man, do the hard thing. Character says, take on the, the tough job. Character says, man, go down the path least traveled. But our flesh, our laziness says, no, stay comfortable. The Bible says this in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7. Do not waste time arguing over godless ideas, old wives' tales. Instead, train yourself to be godly. Now, what does that sound like? Train yourself to be godly. It means get out of your comfort zone. Start lifting some heavy weights. Start having resistance to your spiritual growth so that you can get stronger. Physical training is good, but training for godliness is much better it promises the benefits in this life and in the life to come. Having character will also mean that you start choosing the best influences, not just the fun ones. Oh, yeah. Come on. Come on. It doesn't just mean that you have to sit there and like, yes, I, I, man, there's a lot of people I love to have fun with, but I need to start surrounding myself with the right people. There's an old saying, the difference between who you are and who you'll be five years from now will come down to the books you read and the people you hang out with. So why are you hanging out with people that are not helping you look more like Jesus? Oh, Pastor Josh, those are my friends from school. Oh, those are my coworkers. Those are my family members. Those are my neighbors. These are the people I've always run with. Yeah, they're the people you've always run with and you haven't grown any at all. I'm not saying be mean. I'm not saying kick them out of your life. I'm saying... Be intentional about surrounding yourself with some people that will help you on your journey. If all I do is hang out with a bunch of losers, are they ever gonna encourage me to be better? No, that'll make them feel bad. 
So deep down, they may call themselves my friends, but they're gonna want me to screw up like they've screwed up because it makes them feel better about their screw ups. <coughs> Come on. This is what the Bible says about it. First, uh, First Corinthians chapter 15. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> Verse 33. Don't be fooled by those who say such things for bad company corrupts what? Good character. I got good character. Yeah, if you hang around with the wrong people, you won't have good character for long. It goes on to say in Proverbs chapter 13, verse 20, walk with the wise, woo, come on, and you'll be wise. Yeah, I want that. But there's a warning, associate with fools and you're gonna get in trouble. If all I hang out with is people that, that get drunk all the time, they're gonna keep wanting me to get drunk with them, not because they want better for me, but because they don't want my good actions to shine a light on their bad actions. So if they can get me to lower my standards, if they sleep around, they're gonna expect me to sleep around. If they talk bad about their husband, about their wife, then they want me to do it and join in with them. Who you hang out with will dictate your actions. So character is also gonna say this. This is a big one. Look, as we grow in character, if we're gonna be men and women of character, then we will start to look to take ownership of our mistakes before we assign blame for a problem. I don't think some of you heard me because if you did, you would have wrote it down. This will change your marriage. Husbands, wives, please lean in. Sons and daughters, if you want a better relationship with your parents, parents, you want a better relationship with your kids, bosses, you wanna see your employee's attitude change? Start to, to take ownership for the problems. Look for ways that you could have been better long before you point the finger. Most marriages, most relationships, most work environments are two people coming up going, you did wrong, here's why you're wrong, not me, you're wrong. And that makes the other person defensive and they gotta throw, no, it's you. And we love to blame other people because we're not, we're not wrong, yeah. That means we don't have character. Character says, yeah, I could blame it on somebody else, but truthfully, I lost my temper. I didn't keep my word. I did something I shouldn't have. I could have done that better. I could have said that better. I could have been more patient. I could have been more gentle. Fill in the blank. The Bible says this in 1 John chapter 1, verse 8. If we claim that we haven't screwed up, which is what a lot of us like to act, we, if we say we haven't sinned, then we're just fooling ourselves. We're making ourselves fools. We're not actually living in truth, meaning you don't have character when you keep acting like your, your farts don't stink. You have to actually say, yeah, I've got issues. Here's the beautiful thing. Verse nine says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from anything that we've done wrong, all of that unrighteousness, all of that wickedness. But then it comes back and it bookends it with another warning. And it says, because I know you guys, this is, this, is, this is John saying, I know how you guys are. If we claim that we haven't screwed up, we're calling God a liar and we're showing that his word has no place in our hearts. It would be a beautiful thing for your workplace to see you be the first one to step up and say, hey, that's on me, my bad. Even if it's only 20% your fault and 80% theirs, take the 20% that, you, that is your fault. Say, hey, I, that's on me. Own it. If they don't own theirs, that's between them and God. You own your problems. Also having character means this. You don't see serving other people as being below you. You don't look at serving other people as something that, that you have reached a level that you're beyond. There's one thing I can say <laughs> about the people that I meet with the highest character. Whenever I've come away from somebody where I'm like, man, they have integrity. She is a person of character. He is somebody I admire. Not only do they have that, but it, always hand in hand, those are the same people that are willing to serve others. Malcolm Forbes, he is the creator of the Forbes magazine. Maybe you've heard of that. He said this, you can tell the character of a man by how he treats those who can do nothing for him. I just watched a whole bunch of politicians all over the country running for Senate, running for Congress, running for president. I watched all these people make all these promises and love everybody, man. They're just so happy to see everybody because they want votes. Now that they've got the votes, how are they gonna treat people? That shows character, that defines character. This is what the Bible says in Philippians chapter two, verse three. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. 
Be humble, thinking of other people as better than yourself. Don't look out just for what interests you, but take an interest in other people too. Have character. Having character will mean this. This is a big one. You're gonna, res- you're gonna start resisting temptation even when you're convinced nobody will ever find out. I mean, this, this is kind of, this boils down character into something that's easy to hold on to. D.L. Moody, a, a famous evangelist, he once said, character is who you are in the dark. It's what you do when nobody else ever sees you. Now, ugh, now we start to feel the pain of do I really have character or not? Because a lot of people, man, a lot of people think you're, you're a great person. You've confused having a good reputation with having good character. Reputation is what people think of you. Character is what God knows about you. See, if we're more honest, we don't want anybody to know some of the thoughts we have. Amen and amen. If we're honest, we we realize that we're not as good as some people think we are. You might have me fooled. You might have the people around you fooled. We think you're a great person. But deep down, you know you don't have the character that God's called you to have. It's the stuff you do in the dark when nobody sees. Matthew chapter 26, verse 41, Jesus says, keep watch and pray so that you will not give into temptation. He says, it's an ongoing battle to make sure you don't fall into this. The Spirit's willing I want to do right, but what? The body's weak. I keep screwing up. That's why in 1 Corinthians 10, it says, no temptation's taken you, but something, but one that's common to man. But God's faithful in all of your temptations and everything you struggle with. God's faithful that he's not going to let a a temptation crush you. In the middle of being tempted, he will give you a way out. It's up to you to decide, I'm not going to give in to the temptation. I'm going to resist the temptation and I'm going to do the right thing. That's character. Here's the thing, you guys misunderstand character. You're like, yeah, I do the right thing. No, no, walking into a store and being tempted to steal something and going, I'm not gonna steal it because there's cops all around and there's video recordings and I don't wanna get in trouble. I don't want my reputation to be tarnished. That's not character, that's wisdom. I don't wanna get in trouble, I will get in trouble. There's a chance I would get in trouble. Character is going, I'm not gonna take something that doesn't belong to me even though I'm convinced nobody will ever see it, nobody will ever miss it, nobody will ever know I did it. I'll know I did it, and God will know I did it, so I'm not going to do it. That's character, and that's what I'm talking about. It's not negotiable if you and I are followers of Christ because we believe in a God who sees everything. And I'm gonna give you, a, 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 I'm gonna give you the, a, hopefully, the encouragement of how to walk in that. But before I do, let me just stop and say this. In this whole list already, some of you are going, man, this is the worst. I feel like you kicked me in the gut and now you just keep kicking me while I'm down. I don't do any of those things right. One, welcome to the club. (laughs) I struggle with this stuff too. We all do if we're honest or most of us do if we're honest because it's an ongoing process to say, man, I, my, my justification happened when I got saved. Man, God, God justified me. I love that. But my sanctification is that process of me learning to live and, and look more like Jesus, where he increases and I decrease. Man, that's where my character is built, and that's where I struggle. And some of you are hearing this, and you're going, Pastor Josh, I've, I've screwed up, man. I've, there are seasons of my life, decades of my life, where I didn't have any character. I made some horrible mistakes. I screwed up. And to you, I would say character also means you get back up when you've fallen. See, character doesn't mean you never make a mistake. The only person who never made a mistake was Jesus. All the rest of us have absolutely fallen and made mistakes. The people that you admire in this world that truly have good character, they're not perfect people but they're people that when they screwed up, they got back up. Bible says in Romans 8, 28, we know that God works all things together for good. He bring everything, he causes everything to work out for good. If we love him, if we're called according to his purposes, meaning if we will commit to walking after him, 
He can make everything. Look at that verse. He causes everything. You know what's included in everything? Everything. Yeah, I know. Really profound, right? Your mistakes, the bridges you burned, the relationships you ruined, the horrible things you said, the wicked things you did. If you confess those to God, if you take ownership like we talked about in 1 John 1, 9, if you confess that to God, not only does he forgive you, but then Romans 8, 28 says he takes all things and he works them together for good. So if you wanna have character, remember, character, your character is not revealed by what it takes to knock you down. We all have temptations, we all have struggles. What knocks me down might not knock you down, but something that knocks you down might not knock me down. It's not a comparison game. Your character isn't revealed in what it takes to knock you down. Your character is revealed in how many times you get knocked down and then get back up. See, the people we respect with character, they learn not to live in their mistakes, but to live in the grace and the mercy of God and get back up. Some of you are wallowing in your self-pity or you're, you're wallowing in shame and regret and Satan is laughing at you because he's like, I've got him defeated. She's never getting back up. What you gotta remember is what Paul told the church in Philippians 3.13. No, dear brothers and sisters, I haven't achieved perfection, but I focus on one thing, forgetting the past. Forget. Paul was a murderer of Christians. You don't think he had regret? You don't think he had shame? You don't think he felt guilty by that stuff? He said, no, Jesus died for my guilt and my shame. I'm letting that go. I'm forgetting the past. And I look forward to what lies ahead. I press on to reach the end of the race and I so I can receive the heavenly prize for which God through Christ Jesus has called us. You see, character, character teaches us that the goal isn't perfection, it's persistent progress. Please remember that. God has not called you to be perfect. If you were perfect, you wouldn't need Jesus. But because we fall short of his perfection, we do need him. And so our goal, our sanctification process, is that after we've invited Jesus Christ to be our Lord and Savior, after we've surrendered our heart to him, we've owned the fact that we can't fix our sin, then we begin to go on this journey that says, man, what matters is that I continue to follow after him. 1 John chapter 2, verse 6, those who say they live in God should live their lives as Jesus did. I wrote this note in my Bible. Josh, let's make a commitment to make sure our character matches the Christ that we claim to follow. Josh, make sure your character matches the Christ you claim to follow. Can you and I just, just own the fact that we, we get to be an ambassador for, for God. We get to be a representation of Jesus to our neighbors and our family members and our classmates. You and I, if you're a believer, and I know not everybody watching this, I know not everybody listening to this message is a believer. Some of you are just curious. You're like, I believe maybe in a God and I'm curious about this Jesus thing. There might be some of you that are like, I don't know what I believe I'm so glad you're leaning into this. Here's what you need to understand. It's this beautiful thing. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone and the new life has begun. This is a beautiful thing. And it speaks to all of our sin, all of our mistakes, all of our shame, all of our guilt. Jesus died on the cross. He paid for that. He wants to set us free from that. Man, we love that part. The old is gone. There's a new life to be had. But here's the, here's the catch. If you want to be somebody who has character, know that there is a new life in Christ. But understand this. Your new identity comes with a new responsibility. In order to be a follower of Christ, to be called a Christian, back in the day, <coughs> it says in the book of Acts that in the, in the city of Antioch, they started calling them Christians. Prior to that, the followers of Jesus were called followers of the way. Jesus claims in John 14, that he says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. That was the message of this Christ, this Jesus. 
This, this, this man from, from Nazareth who claimed to be the Messiah, who died on a cross and rose again from the dead. This is what he claimed. He was the way to God. So people who put their faith in him as the Messiah, as the risen Savior, they were called followers of the way. And somewhere, somebody said, no, you know what? Let's call him Christian. And the term Christian meant you're a little Christ. You're a follower of that Jesus Christ guy. So today when we say, I'm a Christian, I'm a believer, I'm a follower of Jesus, we're saying, I'm a mini Christ. Here's the problem when it comes to our character. We don't understand that Christian is the noun. We treat Christian like it's the adjective. You say things like, I'm a believer, so, so now I'm, uh, uh, here, here, here's my life. Now that I'm saved, I'm a plumber, but I'm a Christian plumber. I'm a teacher and I'm a Christian teacher. I'm a mom or a dad, but I'm a Christian mom. I'm a Christian. Listen, that sounds good, but what you're doing is you're saying that the most important thing is your identity being found in your job or your occupation, your, 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 your family, something like that. Christian becomes this modifier to who you are, and you're like, yeah, that's, I'm, just, I'm, I'm, I'm a plumber, but I, I also I try to be Christian. I'm, I, I'm trying to do it this way. Here's what, here's what you can understand. When, when you truly become a new person and you say character, the, the character I want is to become more like Jesus, then you understand that Christian is the noun. You're not a, a, a Christian plumber. You're, you're not a, 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 a Christian plumber. You're a Christian who does plumbing, not a plumber who happens to be a Christian. You're not a teacher who happens to be a Christian. You're a Christian who happens to teach. You're not a, a dad who happens to be a Christian. You're a Christian who gets the privilege of fathering children. You see how that, that shifts? Some of you have tried to make to take Christian as the noun and then add other adjectives to Christian. Like that makes it better. I'm a Republican Christian. I'm a man, I'm a I I'm a I'm a I'm a gay Christian or a heterosexual Christian or a Democrat Christian or I'm a you know I'm I'm a I'm a white Christian or a black Christian or a Brazilian Christian. What are you doing there? You're saying that there's something that's now gonna modify the big thing? No. No, if you're a Christian, that's the most important thing. And that's where character comes in. And you say, hey, nothing else modifies this. Nothing else changes the fact that I'm surrendered to Christ. First Peter chapter 1, verse 15 says it this way. But now you must be holy in everything you do, just as God who chose you is holy. If you're really a Christian, if you're really a follower of Jesus, you have to be holy. He says, you must be holy because he was holy. Guys, it, the, the Bible is saying this isn't optional. It's essential. It goes on to say in Colossians 3, 9, don't lie to each other. You've stripped off your old sinful nature and its wicked deeds and you put on the new nature to be renewed as you learn to know your creator and become like him. Your job is to become like Christ. Well, how do I become more like Christ? He increases, you decrease, John 3, 30. Well, what does that look like? Every day you choose to take off. Romans chapter 12 said, brothers and sisters, present yourself, your bodies as a living sacrifice. What's a living sacrifice? It means that you get up every morning and you die to your old nature. You die to yourself, your old self. You drive a nail in those temptations. You drive a nail in all of the adjectives that want to change your character to becoming negotiable. You take that off and you put on the new robe, the new person, the one who says more of Jesus and less of me. God, thy will be done. That's what it looks like. Character, guys, character is going to be something that you lean into and you understand this. Listen, it is going to be something that's built by choices. It's not built by time. Your character isn't built because you've been a Christian for 20 years. It's not built by time. It's built by your choices. There are some old heads right now, gray hair, wrinkles, and you do not have character, but you've been a believer. You've been a Christian. You've been going to church for decades I know a lot of young people, baby Christians. I know teenagers who have more character than 50 and 60 year old quote unquote churchgoers. Character is not determined by all of that time. Hopefully you have more wrinkles and more gray hair or less hair or whatever. 
hopefully that's given you more wisdom, but it, it doesn't mean you have more character. Character comes down to the choices you make. And you can be really young. You can be brand new to the faith and have more character than some of the people around you if you're willing to have more of Jesus and less of your old self. This is what it says in Proverbs, 20, in Proverbs chapter four, verse 23. Guard your heart above all else. It determines the course of your life. Those little choices that you make determine the course of your life. Anybody know who Herb Brooks is? Yeah, I know you're watching, but raise your, okay, okay, a couple of you know. The rest of you, probably not hockey fans. Herb Brooks was the coach for the 1980 Olympic hockey team. If you ever heard Al Michaels, the famous saying where he says, do you believe in miracles? They beat the Russians. The Russians were this powerhouse juggernaut professionals, and the American team was largely amateurs, college kids, and Herb Brooks took those guys and they won. And it's this amazing gold medal. You can go watch the movie, The Miracle. Maybe you've seen that. But Herb used to tell his guys this. He's quoted as saying, your, you build your character every day by the choices you make. Meaning, we keep looking for a big, big choice, a big, big decision, and that'll display our character. No, your character is gonna be made in the little choices. Get up and make your bed. Don't run red lights. Be honest with your boss when you make the mistake. Have the character to do the small choices the right way, and then you'll actually build the character up so that when you're presented with this big temptation, you'll still choose the right thing. That's what he's talking about. This is what Galatians chapter five says about a life surrendered step-by-step, step, incrementally making the right choices. It says in Proverbs 5, 22, the Holy Spirit will produce this kind of fruit in your life. Love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. There's no law against producing this kind of stuff in your life. Somebody with character, their life will look like that list. Look at that list. How much of your life looks like that? Love, joy, peace. How many people, how many of your coworkers? How many of the other kids on the bus that ride to school with you? How many of your family members? If I polled your friends, how many of them would say, oh yeah, she's a person of peace. He's a person that's filled with goodness and kindness. The Bible tells us that our, our deeds, in Matthew chapter five, it says our deeds, our good deeds should shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise our heavenly father. The, the fruit on our branches, the character that God is allowing us to step into, that good character isn't meant so we pat ourselves on the back and have, a, have this great reputation about how good a people we are. No, it's to, it's to say God can redeem a dumpster fire like me. He could do something in your life too. And what we understand about all of this, if you don't take anything else away, understand this. Your character reveals your connection to God. As a Christian, you're supposed to be an ambassador. You're supposed to represent something higher than your own agenda. That's why you die to your selfishness and you put on the new nature, the one that says, hey, I'm a follower of Jesus. Why? Because if I, if I begin to develop the character that God's called me to, then my life will look less and less like the selfish version of the old me and I'll start to have the joy and the patience and the gentleness and the self-control. This is what it says in Luke chapter six, verse 43. A good tree can't produce bad fruit and a bad tree can't produce good fruit. A tree is identified by its fruit. This is, you're like, yeah, that kind of just makes sense. He's using it as a metaphor. You and I are producing whatever it is that we're connected to on the inside. He says, figs are never gathered from thorn bushes and grapes are not picked from bramble bushes. Here's where he ties it in. A good person produces good things from the treasury of a good heart and an evil person produces evil things from the treasury of an evil heart. Ooh, here it comes. Whatever you say flows out of what's in your heart. That hurts New Englanders probably more than most people. <laughs> 
Why? Because we love to think we have good character. But because character has become so negotiable, we do it when it's easy, we do it when it's comfortable for us, we do the right thing when we think other people will pat us on the back, but we don't really hold to the standard of having character when nobody else is watching or we don't think it'll be beneficial to us. And that's why our lives aren't really filled with the fruit that they're supposed to. Now, maybe you have some fruit. You're like, my life isn't a total train wreck. I have some good things. How much more good fruit could be on your branches if your connection was stronger? Do you remember what it is that Jesus said in John chapter 15, verse five? Jesus said, yes, I'm the vine and you're the branches. And if you remain in me, meaning connected to me, you die to yourself daily and let me increase in your life daily. And I do that, I'm, you're in me and I'm in you. You're gonna produce so much more of that good fruit. Your character will drive you to be a person of joy and peace and patience and long suffering and all of the fruits of the spirit. But without me, you can't do any of that. See, some of us were trying to muster up good character or good morals but we're trying to do it without truly being surrendered and connected fully to Jesus. Most of you watching this, if you're honest, you like to sprinkle in a little Sunday morning Jesus to your life, but Monday through Saturday, you're looking out for you, you're going after what you wanna go after, and your character does not reflect somebody surrendered to the God of the universe. Now, some of you, you don't even have any connection to, it, to Christ at all. The goal of this, of this message, I really was trying to speak to those of you who know Jesus, but I don't think you've surrendered to be fully connected to him. He's not a priority in your life, so that's why the fruit isn't being produced. That's why the character isn't something that you're known for. But I have to, I have to go back to who I talked to at the beginning, those of you who don't really know Jesus at all. You're curious about this. You're wondering about it. You have denied access to the King of Kings. You've told Jesus that he can be a vague part of your life. You've never surrendered to him. Here's what I wanna invite you to do, no matter where you're at. You're either a sinner that needs salvation or you're a, a Christian, a follower of Christ who needs to look more like Christ tomorrow than you did today. But we're all sinners some just in need of continuing to take off the old and put on the new, and some of you, you just need to come to Jesus and surrender your heart for the very first time. I wanna invite you, if you would, to just bow your heads with me. Just bow your head and close your eyes. And in this moment, I just want you to ask, God, am I falling short of the character you've called me to? God, am I, have I fallen short of who it is that you've asked me to be? Lord, is there, is there areas of my life where I don't point people to you, where I don't have fruit? I don't, I'm missing out on so much more of what my life could be. God, today, show me how I could be more connected to you, how I could die to some of my old habits. Maybe you regret your old habits, but you've never confessed them. Confess, say, God, I'm sorry about that addiction. I'm sorry about that affair. I'm sorry about those words that I say or those websites that I look at. God, I'm sorry for my habits, for my, for my greed and my selfishness and my lust. You fill in the blanks. He already knows, just own it. Have the character today to own. God, I'm broken and I need more of you. And while there's people praying all over, inviting God to just have a renewed connection in their life. There's some of you, you need to right now have the prayer that says, God, come into my heart. There's some of you that know about God, you know about prayers, you might have even read the Bible, but you've never surrendered control of your heart to Jesus. You've never allowed him to be the one sitting in the driver's seat. Today could be your day if you would just simply have the humility and the courage to surrender the driver's seat, surrender control of your life and say, God, I can't fix me, but I believe you can. Come into my life, I, I give you my heart. God, would you just be my Lord and Savior? Doesn't have to be those exact words, but that needs to be the attitude. I'll pray for you, but I can't make any of those decisions for you. So as I pray out loud, would you just pray quietly right where you are? Dear Heavenly Father, Lord God, we come before your throne and we thank you, God, for being 
the God who's generous and loving and patient and kind. And so, Lord, today we, we admit we do not have the character. We don't make the choices that we should. We act like it's negotiable. We act like it's an optional thing. We forget how essential our connection to you is and the holiness that you've commanded us to live in. God, if we're honest, our lives look anything but holy. And, Lord, our marriages are suffering from it. Our families are broken because of it. Our workplaces are toxic because of it. God, our schools are crumbling because the Christians that you've put in these environments, God, we don't live like Christ. We don't shine a light like we're supposed to. Lord, today in this moment, would you bring us back to becoming men and women, boys and girls with character, people who are surrendered to doing things your way, to making the tough decisions, to taking the high road, when everybody else wants to do something else, God, when, we, when we, we're willing to, to step outside of our comfort zone and do what nobody else is willing to do, to, to tell the truth when it's easier to lie, to be faithful and work hard when it would be easier to be lazy, God, allow us to be people who forgive quickly, who love easily, God, who share open-handedly. Let us have that kind of character, and today, God, draw people to you. There's some people listening, they've walked away from you, they've backslidden, they've, they've drifted, they've, they, they've forgotten how good you are. God, show them how sweet it is and how open your arms are to welcoming back the prodigal son. But Lord, also today, would you just save those people willing today to admit that they need you as their savior. God, I'm excited about what you're gonna do in our lives and about the fruit that will be produced on the trees of, uh, our, uh, of the people here at Harbor, of the people listening to this message. God, I'm excited for how our communities and our homes are gonna change as we die to our old self and find more and more connection to you. So God, we pray this, we ask it, and we praise you for what we believe is gonna happen, all in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen.